so hi, my name is Nancy Fulton. I currently run events for more than 40,000 entertainment industry pros uh, here in Los Angeles and across the nation. And today I'm interviewing Scott Morgan, who will be talking about um, his background in entertainment and how he works with screenwriters to make it so they can sell their screenplays and so they can uh, earn more money from the work that they do. So with that in mind, I'll, do you want to start for talking for a few minutes, Scott, sort of about how you entered the entertainment industry and um, how you've enjoyed such a long, <laughs> a long <laughs> career making, <laughs> writing screenplays for people to produce? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I really like the fact that when I came back and mentioned I was working with you, several people said, oh, I know her or about her. Mm -hmm. uh, I come and go to Asia quite a bit. So mm -hmm. I need to catch up when I come back. It was wonderful that I get this opportunity. And mm -hmm. I have been in the industry uh, since I was about 27 years old when I first uh, came here from Chicago. So I've seen the phases where it went from 35 millimeter and the very slow process of approving directors, producers, and writers because film was burning at $1,000 a minute. And they weren't about to put you there unless you knew things. And it was also a time when agents and producers actually would be able to mentor a writer. And that actually starts off um, you know, with my story about how I got here because I never intended or was drawn to Hollywood before. Uh, I was in Chicago, I was modeling for some uh, ads and I got two nationals in a row and they said, you've got to come to Hollywood. And I'm one of those freaky stories that when I came in eight weeks later, I'm on a show, not on a big SAG situation. They came over and said, are you SAG? Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody didn't work out, um, just fill in. And they liked working with me. It was Paper Chase with John Houseman, award-winning show. So last year had low budget. And they said, how about if we give you uh, you know, four days of silent bit or stand in, and then we're gonna give you one day of SAG if we're lucky per week. But I lived right across the street from um, uh, 20th Century Fox, and suddenly I'm making 1500 uh, a week. And the funny thing is that um, I never wanted to be an actor, so I was more drawn to the other side of the camera. I had been shooting 35 millimeters since I was 14 years old on an old Pentax, and I was asking questions of the sound people, the lighting people, and really paying attention. And I urge that with writers, if you get a chance to be on the set, even as an extra, be there and learn. Now, oddly enough, that takes me over to Universal Studios, where I ended up being the uh, stunt and body double on The Insiders. That's when I started writing screenplays. And I'm writing on the set, and there was a young woman that was also a stand-in for a couple of weeks. We got to be good friends, and she wanted to read a full new script as an actress hopeful. and um, I had just finished it, and back then I was, you had to write by pen, and I would go to my dad's office and get these giant mainframe computers, and I would type it into a computer, and I finish it, and I hand it to her on a Friday. Well, what she didn't tell me was, and this is to show you how much a role luck plays in this industry. She didn't tell me she's Heather Locklear's roommate. Heather was having a secret relationship with one of the top executives at Universal, Heather reads it, thinks it's hilarious. He reads it on Sunday. On Monday, I get a call out of the blue saying, this is Universal Studios calling. And I, I'm, I think I'm in trouble, like fired off of the insiders. And he says, did you write this script? And I said, yeah. And he says, we laughed out loud, but I don't think you know how to write a script, do you? And I said, <laughs> well, no, I, I've never taken a class. He goes, you've got the, the, the funny bones, as they used to say, um, mm -hmm. but you need a really good agent. I'm going to hook you up with Swanson Agency. Now, Swanson was from New York. He was the last of the great literary agents that really could mentor. The guy, I think, retired the following year and died two years later. But he really brought me along in what I didn't know. I could be a creative writer, but the formula was so important. Now, toward the end of his year of representing me, another chance luck comes up. I'm out at uh, basically a bar. I'm hanging with friends and some actor model hopefuls. And somebody came up to me and he says, I want to be your lawyer because uh, you hang around fun people. And I just graduated from Harvard. And I said, great. Um, <laughs> he ended up becoming one of the most powerful lawyers in Hollywood. Great guy. He got me my first good bucks deal with HBO and you know negotiated some other deals as he was climbing up and then got to represent, uh, I think, uh, just Julia Roberts, all the really great uh, names, and it really brought me in. So I want to emphasize this because so many screenwriters just um, hunker down 
in their home and they don't get out there, especially now with the internet, they think they can do everything from there, but I wouldn't have met either of those people or had that first intro. Now, my very next script ended up getting picked up um, by uh, Warner Brothers Studio on a, a very low um, option agreement, but I was with Silver Pictures and, and suddenly I'm in. Um, now, over the years, I, I began in studio and agency work, kind of in a fluke, really lucky, I, I got to admit. Um, but uh, at the same time, there were people like Justin Dardis and some really great uh, agents for me as a writer that said, you're almost there, Scott, I'm gonna make you that much better. But one of my great turning points came when I sent, uh, back then, remember we used to um, read the pink section in the entertainment section in the Sunday paper. I do remember. Really thick. And I would always cut out these articles and I would find the names, I would do this research and I sent out to 12 people. Only one of them called me back. He was one of the most powerful people in Hollywood and he just had 15 seconds for me. He goes, hey kid, you're a good writer. I don't know where you came from. Um, you're not big enough for CAA, but there's gonna be some changes here, which was of course when they split off and made Endeavor. Come find me someday, cause you've got talent, but I'm gonna tell you one secret. Go to the Writers Guild, find the oldest librarian there, and say, can you give me the 10 favorite scripts of your entire years working here? I included Body Heat, the original script for um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. These were very richly written scripts. And I know right about that time, Spielberg came out and said, a script should only be a blueprint. And everything started to become very lean. But if you read these great works, they're mm -hmm. as poetic as anything. And I'll tell you that one of the scripts everybody loved, of course, was Die Hard. And the writer took great liberty um, in this script. When it came to the scene where they were shooting through the glass, it says, and they opened fire and he spotted words all over the pages like bullet holes. Because wow. he could take the liberty of it. And, and it just got you so into it. You said, this is a fun script to read. Aside from the story, anything mm -hmm. you can do to keep these people locked and wanting to turn the page saying, hey, I like this guy. It's a bonus. Mm -hmm. So my past includes Warner Brothers, TriStars, Paramounts, Options, and I worked with some really great A-listers. Uh, there was HBO, and eventually my agent, who was at Gersh at the time, um, he ended up saying, Scott, I think you've got uh, director's talent in you. Why don't you take some of that money you made and direct something, which was the directing of playing Solitaire, mm -hmm. which I shot in 35 millimeter film, um, and it, only entered three film festivals, won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Writer, but it really came down to the writing. The story was a really mm -hmm. twisted girl revenge story. And mm -hmm. that was my start, you know, with some people that were in the days when they actually made writers better. Mm -hmm. Now, from that, just being out with people, I ended up meeting the top development girl for Freddie Fields. She says, come on in, I just got a job here, have you got something hot? And Freddie Fields, most people don't know this, was the, one of the original agents for ICM. He represented Cary Grant, Sophia Loren, everybody else. He was in his latter years. But he and Hellman, his partner, did Glory, Midnight Cowboy, American mm -hmm. Jigsaw. Every film got awards. He actually liked me, and he decided to mentor me. And he taught me one of these great scripts, uh, tricks that you and I were talking about, tightening a script. Mm -hmm. He says, all right, you think the script's at the very best and tightest it can be at 108 pages? I want you to sit down and cross out every third line, whether it's description or dialogue. And I'm saying, I can't get rid of some of my best writing, but I did. At the end, we read it out loud, sitting across from each other. And he says, see, better script, right? If you can make people laugh 50 times in 25 pages, it's funnier than if you could do it in 30 pages. Mm -hmm. The laughs are tighter. He taught me not to be married to my words and how to write for actors and actresses to really hook them in. What do they need and look for? Now from that, he says, okay, we're gonna go to Paramount with this because I think this is the best for it. Write down on a piece of paper the most money you hope to get for this. I wrote it down, he looks at it and he goes, I'll double it. And I said, sold, he goes, don't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And he goes and he sets it up and I get my first really strong option with a strong rewrite pay. Um, but from that, it introduced me to Barry London, who was running the studio along with uh, Sherry Lansing. So again, I'm telling these writers, you've got to start making these relationships in the flesh, sit across from people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Freddie liked me because I reminded him of his son. And that's where our bond started. And he could have never gotten that over the internet or IMDb. And now Barry London, the funny thing is, is um, after playing Solitaire, I get picked up 
to write and direct several test pilots of really good budgets. I mean, you're mm -hmm. talking 400,000 to 860,000 for a pilot, test pilot. Mm -hmm. And I'm in Fiji, I just finished and I come back, I get a phone call, phone rings, says, hi, I'm looking for Scott Morgan who wrote um, ATM, Go Big and Go Home. And uh, I said, well, that's me. So this is Barry London. And I said, the guy that did Rich Girl, which was voted the worst movie that year. And he goes, no, no, no. He laughs. He goes, no, the, the head of Paramount Studios did <laughs> Titanic, Forrest Gump, Braveheart. He lists all these things. He goes, would you come to my house? I come to his house and there's the sword from Braveheart and, you know, the helmet from, um, uh, all, from Tom Cruise's Top Gun and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he leads me to his desk and he, he points to five scripts. And he mm -hmm. says, we have been harvesting your scripts. You're this weirdo freak. First spec script that came in, we liked. I said, hey, this guy got lucky. Three weeks later, I get another. Two months later, another. There's what you do, and you don't even know you do it, is you're the most marketable writer I met. Now, why is that important to you writers out there that are watching? One of the hardest costs for a studio now mm -hmm. has to do with advertising. If you can write a marketable script, he says, you know your target audience and you hit them again and again and again with what they want to see. You don't say this is a movie for every single person in the world. Mm -hmm. You say if my genre is teens in this category or adults involved with rom-com ideas, you know, you hit them with it. And then I can narrow the advertising. I can see the trailer in your script. I say, these are trailer moments and you pepper your script with them like crazy. So. Mm -hmm. I want to appeal to uh, work with you, just with you, and let's go to William Morris and let's do a mini studio like Millennium. He had just been picked up and then let go, my, not let go, he quit Millennium, but he had other sources of money. Now, unfortunately, his throat cancer came back mm -hmm. in his career, but he says, Scott, I've mentored you, I've taught you everything that you need to know about running a studio. If you mm -hmm. really believe in Asia and China, you've been over there a lot, which is another story altogether. Mm -hmm. Oh, take what I've learned, take your great war chest of screenplays you've written with other people, people have hired you to write, and, and see what you can do with this. And he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Through that period of time, I got a little time with Sidney Pollack, Tony Scott, and it eventually led with my independent writing um, to getting picked up by one of my biggest jobs, which was with the Nobel family. Mm -hmm. They have an incredible family saga, and mm -hmm. they had, um, already hired three rather famous writers in Europe that uh, had written um, Jane Austen type movies, Pride and Prejudice. And they said, every time they write it, it feels like a European movie. We want a Western feeling movie. And just to tell you other writers what you might be in for, their attitude was very condescending. They said, well, we know you're probably gonna write something that's not good enough for us. And we know it'll probably take you nine months and we'll have to hire a very famous writer and pay him 500,000 to rewrite you. Um, and I said, fine, I'm gung-ho. I didn't look at this like a down. I said, this is an up, it's a challenge. They sent me a stack of books to read this deep on the history of the family. And three months later, I turned in a script. And by this time I had learned to work with people um, that are hiring you, listen to them. Their saga was 164 pages long. But I said, tell the story you wanna tell. And then I'm gonna show you with my skill and craft how I'm going to make this a two hour movie shrunk it down to 124. They couldn't believe I was telling the same story. Didn't miss the scenes I deleted. I said, now we can go out. And I mentioned that because as writers, eh, half of us can be really gung-ho about it. And the other half can say, well, I'm the writer and I have all sorts of freedom, but you're not doing yourself or the producers any favor. You really want to remember, you want to make this um, uh, very favorable to both parties. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the other thing that Barry taught me that was really interesting is he says, okay, you're going to sit in with me some meetings. People are going to come in and pitch as a writer or a smaller producer. They're going to leave. I'm not going to tell them who you are. And then we're going to talk about what my feelings with all my 17 years of experience feel about what they said. What mistakes did they make? What was mm -hmm. shallow? What was engaging? What was memorable? Hey, this was a bomb, but I like the guy. I'm going to call him back. It, it really was fascinating to find out that the things that he chose to talk about were not what a writer would normally think like, did he remember that sentence when I could have told it in a different order? No, he's looking at this bigger picture, seeing the writers as a part in a very fine watch. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, it's really 
uh, was great experience for me to get on both sides of, of the table. It led to a really good relationship with DeLuca. I kind of naturally had this in, in me when DeLuca was first starting out with um, New Line Cinema, and it taught me um, cinematic structure. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know we're not going to talk too much about China, but um, well, I've been helping orphans for about uh, mm -hmm. 18 years there. And it was China, Vietnam, and Thailand. The first time I went over there was actually with Jean-Claude Van Damme in 1994. He had written, read a script of mine called um, Blood, Sweat, and Gold about South America. And mm -hmm. once again, I thought it was my friends pranking me. You got to call at nine o'clock at night. This is Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's doing a night shoot. He says, I want you to come out and see me. And I said, no, nah, not really. He says, no, it's really me. <laughs> Here was the problem. Warner Brothers was going to do the quest, but somebody had to go into the underground in Hong Kong be willing to go you know with the gangs and find out what the true story is going to be when it converts back to china rule and i went over there and i'm involved with the people uh they uh, still had the walled city they were tearing it down which was a um, gangland center and they showed me the nuts and bolts of their trafficking they sent me to thailand uh to find out what happens over there best time of my life i'm sitting around hey so i'm the only person that didn't kill somebody at the table and they go yeah you know <laughs> this is so important because it gives you life experiences writers usually start out writing about what they know um less than zero is an example and the uh early teen movies are examples teens writing about teens but if you're a real writer you're going to find yourself drawn into writing the things that are the furthest from you and oddly enough i have a twin sister i was known for writing some of the best strong female characters my agent even says, I hate to see you go because when there's a new male writer and he tries to write a script with a female lead, I hand him one of yours and it says, look, just read Scott's work. It's, it, every one of his scripts with a strong female lead uh, works encompassing all audiences and really feels like a solid movie rather than a movie that was made intentionally to star a female lead. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this stuff in this worldly skill allows you to, uh, when you're called especially for true life stories, go outside of your living box where you would normally be, it calls upon imagination. Now, writers don't think about this. This is one of my few props. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Yeah, it, it looks prettier than I do. <laughs> <laughs> it is the process of creating something out of nothing. That's mm -hmm. what writers are doing. It starts with the five intelligences, the six wisdoms, the five mediums. Then the seven origins of art are way down here. Writing is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the sources of perpetual energy, because as writers, your ability to create something out of nothing comes from, the, from within. Mm -hmm. Sources of joy, sorrow, conflict. They have to be perpetually churning in you. And finally, you get them out of, to the people, which is the last box, which is appreciation. Mm -hmm. The deep study of the creative process starts to, I think, come to writers later in their career, um, i am definitely been around long enough that you could say I'm later in my career, but the process is fascinating and you young minds out there saying I'm writing my first screenplay. You've got this creative juice, but the industry is such a strange machine. I've had people in the mafia or the oil industry say if they acted like this around us, they'd be dead by morning. Are you crazy? You guys are nuts! Actually, one of the things that um, I wanted to touch for a few seconds on yeah. is um, yeah, I'm, I'm often telling people that uh, weird things happen to people in Hollywood, in Hollywood. <laughs> weird things happen to writers particularly. I think part of it's because we tend to be the writers are kind of the first member of crew, so to speak, that come in mm -hmm. and they end up talking to the, to the producer and, he, and they end up being the ones that pitch to, the, pitch to the funders. They are the ones that end up pitching to the lead actors. To some degree, they're kind of this core this heart that holds the whole project together. So they find themselves in some very strange rooms and sometimes <laughs> weird, things, weird things happen in those You're rooms. Laughing. And, <laughs> and they don't realize it's them. Like I, just a minute ago or a little while ago, we were talking about the fact that I've been in rooms where I've pitched something to somebody, you know, and then they've got the script that it does. And then they come back and it's like, they go, you should put in a scene that it does. And I'm like, there, there's a, the scene you just described is exactly in the screenplay. And I, you know, after two or three times this happened, I realized some people are kind of functionally illiterate. Like they, they can't really read the screenplay. 
And you mentioned that you have to kind of stay really upbeat. You just have to realize that's how Hollywood is. You just have to go, okay, this is how this is. But I think a lot of times screenwriters just go, is there something wrong with me? Did I not pitch it correctly? Why didn't they actually read the screenplay? Or did I write it so badly they couldn't understand what they were reading? You know, so that I think writers really have to struggle with the notion of this is the industry as it is. There's all kinds of people in it. They do all kinds of interesting things. And you kind of are this linchpin mm-hmm. that everything else, if, if, without you, the project doesn't go forward. The screenplay has to be solid enough that everybody's going to put their time and money and effort into it. Yeah. You know? And that's well, one of the things that you talked about is the fact that it's something, I think you said something about you have to stay upbeat because otherwise the whole, you kind of bring everybody down. Well, I think one of, one of the benefits of people say of working with me and the people I pitch to, whether it's in an Mm -hmm. office for a production company or it's at a pitch fest or wherever it is, an elevator pitch. um, I'm, I'm somebody that gets it enough and moves swiftly enough that it makes their job easier. They can tell I'm aware of their situation. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of people should understand that a lot of times your work is judged, first of all, by a newcomer that's been given a 15 page uh, uh, information sheet on how to reject your script. Uh, Their job, their first job is as a gatekeeper to keep from wasting the time of their boss. Once they say yes to your script, they have just obligated the time of every one of their superiors. They'll never be fired for passing on a script, but they can be for wasting too much time. And I think that's one of the reasons why agents used to say, if you're gonna go into pitch, always have three, burn through them fast, see which one they wanna come back to. But remember that their job starts at 6 a.m. sometimes, ends at 8. They look at us as luxury people that sleep. Um, There was a comedian that said he wanted to sleep a lot, and his choice was to either be a monk or a writer and realize writers can uh, sleep a lot longer. And so, you know, while they're burning themselves out, we come in thinking we're the center of the world. And yes, it comes down to the script, script, script. But it's almost kind of like catching a train. You have to run as fast as you can so you can catch their train. Don't expect them to slow the train down. They can't reverse their world or take into consideration somebody that's a really truly miserable person to share a room with. Because if they, you know, if they bring the person to the boss, the boss is gonna say, ugh, I can't stand this guy. And I told you the story about the studio, the producer head that was afraid of ghosts. And in, in the first sentence of my pitch, I said, so this ghost, and they stopped me and they said, our boss is terrified of ghosts. He will pass on this next. <laughs> you know? And they, they, I was, that was TriStar. They picked up my next pitch. So that's good. Mm-hmm. So listen, be, be, on, be part of their team. Don't, don't be this Bukowski isolated writer. You know, we're, as Dudley Moore said, not all of us are drunks because we're poets. Some are drunks because we're not poets. You right. know, and we evolve. Mm-hmm. So now, uh, when, when one of the reasons I'm interviewing you is because you're one of the you're uh, a senior writer, senior screenwriter who can work with people sort of on the soup to nuts, basically all the way from uh, reviewing their screenplay, giving them notes, helping them actually improve it, or writing writing their screenplay for them or co-writing their screenplay for them, um, and all the way through uh, the pitching, teaching them how to pitch. So pitch practice and pitching. Um, uh, train pitch training and being in the room training so to speak yeah. all the way through okay somebody says they want to buy this from me and I don't know if they're real I don't know if I should do this deal I don't you know I don't because a lot of times it's kind of like you you catch a fish and you don't know what to do with it because you've yeah. never caught a fish before so they don't and also there's a lot of people in Hollywood who will take your take your intellectual property and they want to do like a one dollar deal yeah you know, one dollar option or whatever and for some people that's a good gig and for some it's really a huge mistake <clears throat> so can so can you talk to me a little bit about the the kinds of ways that you sort of help why you choose to help screenwriters and also how you choose to help them sure create package and sell their work well part of it comes back to when i directed playing solitaire i had to leave the agency world to work freely with non-union people and um so i left uh, uh my agency which was very fine and went independently on my own. Uh, if I, I knew how hard it was, if I could see the future, I probably would have stayed in agencies. But by being independent, I was able to uh, let myself be hired out, uh, underpaid on these sets, listening to people. And then I was also now doing my own deals. And 
I have to say, uh, if I had listened to you, you know, when I was in my 30s and believing that people that are my friends would have me sign a contract that's mutually advantageous, um, I would have gotten several big pictures done, but uh, they were very one-sided, um, excuse me, and uh, killed the deal. Um, and I had to learn the hard way that you really need to spend the time to go to a, um, as good an entertainment lawyer as possible to explain the liabilities. I mean, people get excited about uh, pitching online or going to pitch fests or entering a screenplay competition without knowing that half of those companies in the small print, they can tie up your work and they must be a producer on it. Managers are even worse. Managers hope that somebody's gonna hit big Mm -hmm. so that they can carry them for three to five years. They didn't necessarily make your magic happen, mm -hmm. um, but you do very well in previous uh, discussions, the difference between agents and managers, the laws they have to follow. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be a manager. You print a business card, you're a manager. Um, same with a producer almost, but you need to have a track record. But people come to me with their ideas. And first of all, it might be all over the place and I need to center it on what formulaically will work. So that's the first step. Or they have a germ of an idea and they want to expand it into something that's marketable. So I'll say, I'm gonna set you up in some very simple tools. We're gonna to build this app, but we're gonna make sure the trailer material, the appeal to stars fit with the heart of your story. Um, and so my first work is actually before we actually start writing, making it the best it can be in almost an outline form. I call it a plot line, it's very simple. Every line is a minute of film. We know exactly what's happening every minute. Works really well. Not as long and time consuming as a treatment. Then, now that we, I say, now we have to see the same movie, and we do, we can write together or you just hire me to write. But as we go forward, I'm gonna be telling you stories about how the industry really works. Now, as you know, you can, burn up all your time chasing certain producers with one particular script and a lot of money on these festivals. And if you're not coming off right and you don't have some luck, um, then you've burned out 10 years of screenwriting and nothing's uh, been produced big enough. Uh, I jump right into it and start telling them what it's like to be on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. to be that person that they want to have called in. And um, I think that uh, I can actually tell the story about the pitch festival uh, I went to. Um, there was a woman named Tajina. Uh, she's from the East Coast and she uh, was in the health industry and she had written a children's book for children in hospitals. And it was a really cool concept that kind of lifts the spirits of these kids. And she had some rough drawings. Uh, I worked with her on a Bible for the show and the pilot episode inventing creative names, we finally have a chance to go to Fade In Pitch Fest. Mm -hmm. She was afraid to go by herself. I don't always go with people, but if they hire me all the way through the screenplay I do, mm -hmm. or the project in this case, it was 9.15, which means it's early in the day for the listeners, they're not fatigued. We came down and I have a very specific system for pitching so that I pitch in less than two minutes, I'm done. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit later, but this is the key takeaway from it. As soon as I finished, I said, and that's it. The producer, and he was a pretty big producer, slams his hand down on the table so loud it gets the attention of everybody in the room. And he says, now this guy knows how to pitch. He didn't waste my time. He told me the heart of the story. I have questions. And I said, yeah, you want to hear another pitch? I didn't want to give him enough that he could walk away from with doubts. I want him hungry for more. I pitch in the second one is just as good. From that point on, in that pitch fest, which lasted two days, anytime I walked in the room, I could feel the eyes of the producer saying, this guy gets it. I may not be a genius. There's a lot of writers better than me, but I get it. I get what they're into. I get the pain they're going through, mm -hmm. trying to encourage writers that have come in with a half-baked idea or they're shy. They just are so nervous that they can't deliver, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, part of this comes with the real world. Um, in the real world, you're confronted with situations that uh, take you out of your comfort zone. They make you build the confidence. They, you know, if you read, if you do other things, you start to value the artistic content in other factors and it comes across in confidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna get into the exact pitching a little bit more in a second. Well, you actually, you, one of the things you mentioned previously is that a lot of times when you're working with uh, screenwriters or when you work with people, 
they've read a lot of books about sort of the how to write a screenplay and a lot of books about how to pitch and you say a lot of the information that they're providing is um it's out of date and or it's, it's out of, it's written for an industry that doesn't exist anymore or it's needlessly complicated like when you talk about um that you sort of have a series of templates that you've uh, collected from the studios over the years that talk that let you create the timing for a screenplay like yeah. so you know what's supposed to be on every page or you know how the flow the the flow has to work and yet there's a million screenplay books out there that don't cover that it can can you talk for a few seconds about why what screenwriters read or what they learn may be not appropriate or may not work at the moment well, in general, um, the hero with a thousand faces still has a lot of strength. We want to be on this hero's journey that lasts about 90 minutes plus. Audiences want to see things and expect to see things happening at certain times. As opposed to TV, you tune in to see the people not going through an arc. You want to see your hero going through an arc. Now, that's the master plan. However, there are different ways to cut it up. Of course, Quentin Tarantino cut it up um, when he did Pulp Fiction, and that was wondrous, but he's an artist in his own class and can get away with that. You present that script to a studio, they'll reject it because they say it's not following formula. Mm -hmm. um, the industry has gone through more changes in the last 15 years than it did ever since it was invented. Uh, two things happen that people don't put enough significance in that should affect every writer, especially young writers. The first seemed inconsequential, MTV. MTV sped up the number of edits per minute that the viewer was used to seeing. They were seeing three times as many edits per minute and, and drinking it in in music videos and uh, the uh, reality shows that they had, fast editing. And before, a lot of the industry was built on these long dolly shots and spending 15 seconds coming into an actor and having the dramatic shadow. But all of a sudden, new audiences were invented that could go clip, 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 clip like that. And then what happened at the same time? The digital camera. You are no longer shooting $1,000 a minute. You were able to put in multiple cameras, which actually ended up being a disadvantage because even though people can come out like Paranormal Activity with a Something Lucky or Blair Witch Project really changed everything um, with the digital work. Uh, you don't get the years of necessary training to bring in the true deep art. Uh, there's whole topics on what um, the digital industry did, um, but I was the very first person to shoot a sitcom with high definition, and the very first person to work with the camera that they shot Simone with, that also Spielberg was using. Um, I had gone through the Panavision uh, School and Orientation of Cinematography, and uh, I got digital because I was studying NASA's footage in high definition like five years before that. So they loaned me a camera at a very low price. I had Patty, Patty Van Over, an award-winning cinematographer, and we worked with these digital cameras that were bigger than the film cameras on set. You know, they were giant. Um, and we really got a lot of meetings out of that. What did you learn in digital? What's gonna be different? But there were some things lost. Now, um, with, the, the young people that are directing, producing, and, and writing, um, they know that people that are their peers, which is the main uh, movie going public now, uh, they can write at a, scenes that have faster clips or in their imagination, they imagine the camera catching everything all over the place, like a four camera sitcom would catch all the reaction shots. From that came the most significant change in style writing, which you started to see in movies like Superbad. It was 12 eight minute scenes that can stand alone, but the reason I'm going like this, they carry the same through line. Now, the best message I ever got from Barry London was he says, all great movies are about something very simple. And he says, what do you think Forrest Gump was about? Most people would say, life is like a box of chocolates. And he goes, no, that's too broad. And the, some, don't underestimate somebody that you think is inferior. No, that's wrong. Zemeckis, Hanks, they get together, for a director, and I'm putting my little air quotes out there, um, and the top actor, what a movie is about is takes on a very different characteristic. It has to appear in almost every scene. Forrest Gump was about surrender to fate. Mm -hmm. It's there in every scene unless it's the most slight transition. When he runs, he surrenders to fate and stops. Captain Dan jumps in the water. Twelve Angry Men was about listen. 
Nothing changed in the movie until someone was listening and it was in every single scene. It was the magic of Sidney Lumet. Um, you know, uh, Network was about the machines are winning. Anytime people started to act like a machine in a scene, they were the ones coming out the victor. So yeah. in your writing, when it's the 12 act, eight page scene model, you still want to make it about something. So what was super bad about teenage life is painful. There was a moment of emotional or, or physical pain in every scene. Why is that so important? Subconsciously, you and I talked about how the unconscious and subconscious mind allow us to get into that suspension of disbelief. Um, it relaxes you for the ride. So you suspend the disbelief and that frees your emotions to attach to the characters you're supposed to care about and follow. So this, this new, sh let's, uh, it's not a shift because not all movies can fit it. Long dramas, movies that are more geared towards adult, they don't really fit as well the um, 12 acts in eight pages that are still following Hero with a Thousand Faces, but they want standalone scenes because the attention span of young people has shortened. They want these clips they can share with a buddy on YouTube or a laugh that they can look up. And this is a stylistic technique that the writer has to determine which one do I want. Now, when they come to me as a, uh, let's say a production company comes with a youth, uh, drama or somebody very established, I'd say, all right, we have a choice here. We want to go solid hero with a thousand faces with three acts and point of no return and two emotional pinches. Or do we want to do the 12 standalone acts because it'll help us frame our story and show us the bar to which we can go in mm -hmm. our ridiculousness, like uh, the hangover. Hangover was, you won't believe what happens next. That was the whole movie, you mm -hmm. know? And, and it, it followed that through line and, and we, we, we accepted it, you know? Mm -hmm. So when people come to me with, with these, aside from teaching them how to pitch, I, I open their mind. I, I kind of stretch their imagination to fit the many things that happen on the other side of the table in the longer history of Hollywood, which endears them to the producers, young and old, because the young ones don't know what they're doing sometimes, or they can't smell a talented script. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can see it fits a formula, but as a writer, if you're lucky, you can help them out. You've made their job easy, and then all of a sudden they, will, they want you all the time, which is great. Mm -hmm. so I think I answered that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, when one of the things that uh, you'd mentioned is that we're now writing for global audiences. Ah, so yeah. When are you, is one of and I know that you you've um, been working to with the Chinese to sort of uh, the Chinese government and Chinese uh, producers to start uh, producing more global content in China for distribution worldwide because previously they've sort of had their own market and then they've licensed content from the United States to show there so um, if you can sort of talk for just a few minutes about how you um, like how you're working with China and also how your stories have to change in order for, or some notion of how your stories have to change. Well, um, right here, I have a quote from Wayne Gretzky. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck has been. Mm -hmm. uh, through my work in uh, Asia, helping orphans, I was on the ground and I ran into some people from Hollywood that I knew in Hong Kong. And I said, you guys here to make a movie? And they said, no, the real money's in renovating the theaters. We're renovating over a thousand theaters at 200,000 a pop to turn them into THX theaters. That's when I knew China was gonna become the market giant that it is now. So that was over eight years ago. Now, right about then was when I was working with Barry London and he couldn't go forward and he says, go to China. Now, you and I are all, we've been around enough, let's say, for us to remember how Hollywood burned Germany, Australia, Ireland, and Japan in trying to partner with them. It's just Hollywood's nature. It's a beast. It'll eat you alive. And uh, I knew that they were going to do that with China. And I said, you know, I really have this great group of other writers that have given me their scripts to polish my own. I want to go over there and commit the time and money, which was quite substantial, um, to spend about 10 months uh, having very confidential meetings. I knew enough about Chinese culture to know that um, they, they were embracing this, but at the same time, they didn't want it all over the news. So mm -hmm. I would meet with them confidentially, and this was something that made me sad. Uh, and usually the first 15 minutes, 
they would interrupt me and say, oh, Mr. Morgan, um, we have not been uh, embracing our own imagination for a long time. And we copy or we can listen to you and you, you can hold our hand and, and, and do this, but our imagination um, and uh, ability to create is undernourished. And at first this was sad, but I, then I knew it was wrong because biology and uh, sociology and anthropology prove that the people in the more uh, harsh environment are, are more attentive to what's happening around them to adapt more, to survive. And they weigh options based on cultural background. Now, that set me out to write something I'm about to show you that we talked about, which is my massive book um, by China First Films on the future of China Hollywood film and media uh, funding and collaboration. Um, you can't take Western uh, philosophy and thought as it came from Greece and Rome and Aristotle and uh, Plato and everybody and just tell it to the Chinese. It has to be culturally ingrained in many generations, the stories they grew up with. So I wrote a second book based on a Chinese parable that started to translate what we know in Hollywood about creation so that now when they read it, they go, wow, we get it. It's, it's, it's in our cultural normal dialogue of family. Now, here's something a little sad. And I'm going to get into about how producers and independent writers can write better for both markets. But when they came to Hollywood, um, they had heard so much about our ethics and uh, our teamwork that they had one, one foot firmly planted in their country, as they can only have because that's where they were born. And the other was planted in the United States, and they had their hand outreached to see all of this great um, camaraderie, working together as a team, and ethics, and they got very little of that. The deals were not very good. And I was actually in China, confidentially meeting, saying, okay, you're about to really get a bit by this um, deal, and it's not your fault. Uh, you were told one thing, but this is what's gonna happen. Now, that's just the business side, but when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the, you're, let's say you're a writer and you come up with a big action film, almost like a comic book movie. In the United States, a cultural difference is we believe that we can get our superhero abilities through a mechanical device like Iron Man or Batman's toys, right? Um, for them, they believe that the superpowers come from the greatest source of truth in the world, which is nature around us. It's in our pets. It's in, uh, that's why they have the Monkey King as a, a big box office hit. And also the body posturing has to be slightly different. You have to imagine it as a writer. You can't have the Western confrontational scenes of face to face. They're sideways if you can study their films. And they move and the paradox of internal struggles that are most relevant in a book called uh, Virtue of the Assassins, which was written centuries ago by a warlord. You start to study these things and and you can still make a movie that plays great in the United States. It's an American movie. I mean, they funded Transformers, but you put in the uh, moments, the internal dialogue, more common in Chinese based on yin yang and Tao. Uh, you, you see it, Chow Young Fat does it a lot, his action movies. Study those, Quentin Tarantino studied those before he made um, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, and you see that internal strange dialogue happening in Reservoir Dogs. Well, when I meet with Wanda or somebody else uh, in China, um, and uh, I, know, I know the history, this book has 25 pages of every deal in Hollywood and who was behind, uh, held every deal in China and who was behind it. You need to understand where they, where they built from. The Wai brothers were all about the actors. so that studio leans that strength. Others were behind, you know, had gaming money behind them. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're writing, uh, just like you know, Miramax or Merchant Ivory long ago gave the incredible Academy Award winning films of love and uh, mm -hmm. uh, unrequited love and uh, the temptations of the artist, um, mm -hmm. whether it's Michelangelo or somebody else. Um, you start to realize each studio has a personality. Of course, Disney's family. People didn't tune into Disney because they had the most money. They tuned into it because they said family values over and over again. Mm -hmm. Universal started coming up with the big action films. Same with the China studios. Now, again, like Gretzky, you want to skate to where the puck is going, but you can't 
cripple your creative drive by accounting formula, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can say, hey, this should, should sell, but then you, you've crippled yourself. And I, I told you the funny story mm -hmm. that agents are the opposite. I'm in a mm -hmm. meeting at ICM and an agent bursts in the door and says, do you have a script about a giant baby? And I said, no, can you write one in 10 days? I said, uh, why? And they said, John Hughes wants a giant baby script. And Universal had a similar <laughs> meeting. They said, we want to do a big film on the monsters. I said, why? And they said, because we own all the toys and merchandise and we can do a ride. We don't care if the movie loses money. We'll make the money for 10 years on merchandise. But you, as you said before, to me, you like to make, you, you envision your personal scripts as really having that as a foundation merchandise, songs, toys, royalties, all that stuff. And I would get into that in detail with somebody that hires me. I'd say, I'm gonna give you the quick cliff notes on it. We're gonna make sure your movie has it. You may not understand it while we're writing, but after it's done, you will. I think that uh, that book that you that you uh, showed, is that something that you're likely to, is it something that you sell or is it, is it on Amazon or is it something that you're uh, looking to place? Only to be shown to the Chinese executives or like the Alibaba and Tencent offices here, if there's a production company or a writer gets in with these people, with me, I would open up to the proper chapter in the book, such as, can Hollywood be saved? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can, uh, can television be saved? The mm -hmm. history, quick history of television, how William Morris made their fortune, where it is now with reality shows, mm -hmm. and how they're making money, or who not to trust in Hollywood, or what are the traps that you don't see in contracts? And then on the creative side, I have about 25 pages on screenwriting as it's evolved. Only the last bit really deals with making sure it's centric to, ha uh, to China culture, the goals of the core party and leader. And you can do this without being political. Mm -hmm. What they are going through is one of what I call the greatest show on earth. They're taking mm -hmm. over a billion people and taking it from a closed society to an open one. Mm -hmm. And they're going as fast as they can. They can't keep up with the changes that we've spent 30 years dealing with socially. And mm -hmm. they've admitted they had a problem in certain areas of IP rights protection and things like that. And they're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, they have four courts that they've opened, already prosecuted thousands of people for IP theft, and even a minor way, like, like if you were to use something on YouTube, next thing you know, you're in court, you know? Mm -hmm. They're very serious about this. Um, but that book is meant solely if I get face to face with somebody, uh, like I'm, I'm in talks now with a local strong production company mm -hmm. and to get proof that the three films and a TV show in our slate will be well embraced by China. We're going to probably call a meeting with Tencent and Alibaba, um, who are the big funders locally here. Mm -hmm. And once they see what I understand about their culture, the core mm -hmm. party, the top down leadership, censorship mm -hmm. bottleneck. Uh, financing bottlenecks and everything else, they see that half of their battle to get great content for China is uh, already accomplished by me in, in my um, uh, perspective onto it. So my strength really comes to a writer or a company that hired me. I will give you the shorthand on this in a week while we're writing. It will come down to the story ultimately, how good is it? But can it be embraced by both nations, maximizing box office, but minimizing advertising costs and so you you do several like um sort of three different things you um you script doctor screenwriter uh, screenwriter for hire and uh pitch doctor and then you have this whole edge of the business that you work on where you're an executive producer or a producer that helps people put together projects and one of the things that you'd mentioned is that when possible if somebody's got a screenplay and they can actually they have what it takes and they have the desire to go ahead and turn it into something that's marketable that's you know and pitchable then you think they that's what they should do but if it's the case and you mentioned the fact that it's not that you will have a particular desire if you help somebody do become a screenwriter and create their screenplay it's just the, the problem is that at some point if you sell that thing the screenplay is not a fixed entity so oh. what ends up happening is that you, you, people just need to understand that when you hire a ghostwriter, it's not that the ghostwriter will demand necessarily always be in the room. It's the case that the screenplay will need changes and the changes, they'll expect the changes to have the same voice as the original yeah. um, creator. Well, I have had some funny stories happen. Um, mm -hmm. Got a call from Texas. Uh, producer there was uh, really big in stage plays. 
Mm -hmm. and he says, hey, I'm trying to find Scott Morgan that wrote this. I said, that's me. Mm -hmm. He asked a couple more questions. And then he asked, have I written the script? Well, it was a ghostwriting assignment. Mm -hmm. And I had said I don't need to have credit, but I knew that I couldn't not answer this and I couldn't lie. And I said, well, yes, I did. And the guy laughed and he says, I knew he couldn't write this thing in the room. He's worthless. He can't even put sentences together or a new plot together. It's a really quick example that when you want pure ghost writing, you could be painting yourself into a corner that you can't get out of, you're embarrassed, and then nobody really likes somebody that cheated their way to the top. What I will do for people is something that agents won't let slip by. Mm -hmm. um, let's say a friend of yours came to me for uh, taking something from a general idea all the way to screenplay, mm -hmm. and they didn't have much written. I'll tell them, look, I'm gonna give you sole story by credit. You're gonna mm -hmm. control the negotiation. You are the person they need to have in the room to sign the contracts, not me, even if I'm co-writing. Story rights, you register it, but copyright it also. Mm -hmm. You're the boss. Now, I, if you team up with me, you'll get more money because I've been writing more and my quote is higher. So you're not going to mm -hmm. lose any money. Mm -hmm. But let yourself share screenplay by credit with me. Mm -hmm. That way, you're not going to get yourself in any trouble. You still get full reward for thinking the story up all by yourself, even though I might create 75% of the story, I'll give it to you. Very few agents will allow that because that would give away their money. Um, yeah. They wouldn't be earning the money that they want. I look at it as an integrity viewpoint, and you and I talked about integrity uh, as mm -hmm. in any part. Mm -hmm. um, it was your baby. You did come to me and mm -hmm. say, I built this house, I want you to paint it. I want you to put in all the furniture. I want you to accessorize it. But it's my land. I've framed it. Can you please finish it? Um, mm -hmm. That's really how I need to look at it. Now, what's happened because of that? I have such a great time with the writers. They say, hey, I'm not going anywhere without you. We're in this together. And that's why I've got several scripts that I can line up for a slate. Um, agents won't let you be that unselfish, which is why, even though I'm a member of WGA, I'm on an inactive status to allow me to work with not only individuals, but if a production house comes to me and say, we have a pet project, we mm -hmm. can't put any more writers on it, or we want to test you out, we don't want to spend 100000 plus with an agency. Right. Work with us, almost like the old-fashioned 1935 in-studio writer, and let's get something magical created. Well, I, that's, think, yeah. I think that's actually um, not an uncommon thing these days. I think the, um, a lot of times producers do have pet projects. So they just want somebody, they really just want to hire somebody to write the thing and be in a way, it's kind of, um, I want to call it like an executive producer writer. It's a writer that actually comes in, takes the screenplay idea that they have, turns it into a marketable work, and, and doesn't need necessarily to get the writing credit, because usually they're involved in the project in another way anyway. So it's not, it's a, I think a lot of producers are working more from the basis of just calling up and saying, we have the idea, we have everything. We know what we need to have there. We need to have a writer for hire that's willing to come in and do this thing, but we may need to attach a name writer because we need to have, uh, oh, sure. we need to have the, we need to, we want to have this guy cause he's hot this week and it'll make it easier to get funding. Yeah. Just like you have, you know, it's to me many times. You got to yeah. just love it. You got to love it. Hey, uh, like Newmarker wants to rewrite me. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I care. So yeah. actually that what you bring up, one of the things that was interesting is, um, the when people look at your IMDb credits, one of the things that you because oh. <laughs> one of the things that you mentioned to me, and it's funny because I've had that too, because it's people that have a normal name, right? Like you want, it's really you should if you're a screenwriter, you should name yourself like you know Atticus Finch, Petunia, <laughs> something, right? So that's like your name is totally not like anybody else's name on earth because uh, MacGuffin Master. <laughs> yes, it, it, like, just, it doesn't really matter. The point is you have to name yourself something that, because, and also you mentioned the fact that you've been in the industry for long enough that you were sort of there in the early days when IMBB was even more of a, of a um, trackless waste and like a frontier town. Like, God, they were so strange because um, you were like not the only Scott Morgan. Oh, I have, there's 28. <laughs> and I had a pitch. Uh, I sent my bio ahead of a pitch and it was a pitch over the internet. And I told you this very first thing right. he says, guy says you shouldn't lie about yourself it's a small town and i'm like what and he said <laughs> you didn't do this and so i had to actually go and get him the budgets and the pictures from production i said i don't put stuff on IMDb because our like my, my credits got scrambled with other scott morgans and they stripped them all away right everybody all the scott morgans because this is how they work like when imdb doesn't like how the credits are working or there's too many complaints 
Yeah. They wipe everybody. Yeah. And then and, they put like a thing, so you can't get back in easy either. <laughs> well, then they said, just give us verification from the company that paid you and tried to sell this. Well, a lot of them were one-shot wonders, and they're out of business. I can't even begin to find <laughs> people from 20 years ago. So I have three credits up there. I'm going to mm -hmm. create a new IMDb profile for my film company, China First Films, and it's going to have everything listed and all right. the new well, deal making. And I, I think, I, and I mentioned to you, if I were you, I'd probably just go the easiest fix, and I think it works best in Hollywood these days, and particularly because you work as an executive producer as well as um, screenwriter, script doctor, and pitch doctor is just to go into IMDb and just add just add one for every project you've done and then get like five or ten people to recommend you. And the reason I say deal with that is because you have some control over LinkedIn. LinkedIn screws with you less. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should be on it. I'm uh it doesn't take that it takes like five minutes to go ahead and set it up. And the other thing is you can have you can also LinkedIn, the other thing is that they've gotten smarter. In the old days when you went on LinkedIn you could only really be one thing. You can only have one current job. So if you've ever start now you can have four or five current jobs. And I think for people like um, people like you who have multiple, and everybody in, if, what I've noticed is everybody in Hollywood, as, as time goes by and they become more sophisticated, they end up with four or five hats that they, have, that they wear. You know, like, you know, they, in effect, you're an executive producer. You are an exe you're a producer and executive producer. And in addition to that, you're a script doctor and you're, you do pitch doctor. But they're all related to this core script. All of those things come from the fact that, that you're a working screenwriter. Yeah. So, they, so but I'm, I like, I know a million people. I know people that are line producers, producers, and executive producers, because those three things go together. I'm either, I'm going to, you can hire me to, to line oh, produce yeah, sure. project. You can make me an executive producer, in which case I'll help you attach talent or get you, get you distribution, or I can be a full board producer because I do produce in my own right. And I think that I, IMDb does not make that an easy, I don't know why they're so strange. Well, look at, um, you try to look up Barry London, head of Paramount Studios on IMDb, there's not a single thing listed, but he was the person that released 17 of the most important films of uh, the 80s and 90s. Right. Uh, starting with Saturday Night Fever was his first big gig. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I have some other things that I want to um, talk a little bit about pitching. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm actually going to talk about your, pi your pitch magic spell, which is what uh, Yeah, well, first of all, I'm going to get to some kind of cool visuals because I get a little bit boring to watch after a little while. <laughs> um, a friend of mine wrote a fantastic children's book, mm -hmm. uh, and it's called The Wish Defenders, mm -hmm. and he had this very um, high-tech little teaser going it's the same cover as this book. You open it up and there's interviews with kids that wow. read it and it was so great. They read it in two days and they can't wait to see the movie. Now, you see the kids come into this room. The reason I show it is if you're gonna bring a prop, make it an awesome prop. Bring it on the level of the producers because then they say, I'm not gonna be embarrassed showing this to my boss. Second thing is budgets. There's a terrific, streaming show that uh, I was hired to write um, by someone very serious about it from New York. It's called Tentacles. And this mm -hmm. has to do with the uh, skate to where the puck going idea. Mm -hmm. A lot of big money, a lot of awards, a lot of great shows are coming up in streaming media. That's Hulu, Netflix, and right. China is the biggest streaming market of ever. You have mm -hmm. to know their limitations culturally. But um, I did Tentacles, which is an international intrigue film uh, of Family witnesses a murder of a senator. Now they're a target. They've got to be wiped out. Can their um, skills that they used as preppers keep them alive long enough to find out who's behind it? They've got a great bad guy. It's nine episodes long, big budget. See, I think as far as skating where the puck is going, streaming to set yourself apart can fill the gap between what a television production would do and film would. Uh, bigger budgets, elaborate sets, and really draw the audience in, win those awards for them, because that's what Hulu, Netflix, and everybody's looking for in, the, in Tencent and Alibaba. Um, and you, I go in uh, with a, a fast pitch on this. It becomes obvious this is a great show, um, but I also come in with a real budget, not a guess, not a top sheet budget, but a 35-page budget that I can say, here's what you're getting into, 11 million, uh, 11.2 for the first three episodes. After that, they're all cheaper, but we do go to Europe. And here's the one for the Nobel film, The Great Game. Um, mm -hmm. If you can bring in props that are on their level, suddenly they're not talking to a writer. They're talking about somebody on their team. They're going to draw you in. Mm -hmm. You might 
even have your project stalled and they'll say, hey, come on in, we love you, you, you get us, um, and we're gonna pitch you an idea and you can take it over from another writer, which happened to the last writer of Patriot Games, and from that point on, he was a script doctor getting paid, I'm not kidding, $500,000, every script doctoring, lived a great life. I, I, I can't even imagine how rich he is, but he knew how to speak their language, you know, and um, so in streaming uh, and in China, you, you also, something you mentioned before, protect yourself, get a lawyer involved, register it right. Um, you are the owner of uh, the project a lot more than you think, but few people have any sort of financial incentive to tell you so. Um, and uh, so, I'm kind of looking through uh, my <laughs> notes. Um, I've got one here that says, screenwriters, I'm a screenwriter, so I'm talking about myself. In general, we're tolerated uh, if we're lucky. Uh, in a bad situation, we're loathed. We're that person that doesn't get it that the uh, development person has to see. We come in and there's nobody attached to it. And this is the other thing. As screenwriters, we have almost zero sycophant appeal. Standing next to us outside the rope of some place or we're sitting at a table, we've got no cred. The last writers that were really hot to be seen with were Joe Esterhaus and Shane Black, Quentin Tarantino, and Nolan. The line has been drawn. I haven't heard any new ones. I think Aaron Sorkin, or Aaron Sorkin's probably oh, pretty cool to true. hang out with. But, true. but you're right. I mean, it's not like nobody's ever says to themselves, hey, you know, I want to go hang out where the screenwriters are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh. <laughs> well, part of it is our process is magical. Maybe there's some, I'd like to say, jealousy from the producers. Uh, our process is magical, and theirs is war. Every, they have different casualties, different ammos, and they get shot in the back by their best friend when they're trying to promote your project, Then they remember it was the writer that got them in a little bit of, of um, trouble. So ramp up your appeal. Now, I'm wearing a blazer because in China, uh, cultural politeness and professionalism is very important. Uh, when I meet with them, I do. So I've become very natural. Being in a blazer, I know most writers um, appear to be casual. Uh, honor the time of the people you're pitching to. Um, their job is not to find necessarily a winner. It's to fill this block, see enough people, and protect their boss from wasted time. Next one is, uh, let me see. Um, Bukowski. Bukowski, everybody likes to think they're Bukowski. Now, there's, his line is, um, I am humanely destroyed. So, I mean, I want you writers to think about this. I'm humanely destroyed. I'm the horse player who became the racetrack that everybody trod to pieces. And so, it's, the industry is what it is. It's, if, if the rewards, anytime the rewards are high, doesn't matter if it's the entertainment business or the drug business, you're gonna have a lot of innocent bystanders killed and you might be one of them on this film, but the next film, you do the deal, you know? Um, da -da -da -da, this one, I love, oh, Brian Reese, my favorite acting coach teacher. If, I need, if I'm missing a small time actor role, I go to him, why? Because he says, I'm not gonna teach you to be the greatest actor of all time. I'm gonna teach you how to win the audition. Your job is winning the audition first. With working with me, when it comes to pitch, it's really, we win the pitch and we let our writing sell for itself, but work with these people. And you know, there's a little bit of a difference, you know, uh, between the two. What else have I got here? Some fun stuff. Um, my work in Asia with orphans in high risk zones and during bird flu, um, got me lunch with President Ronald Reagan as a writer, which was really cool. Yeah, it was really funny. See, that's the thing. If you think about it, you notice you didn't get it for writing. <laughs> yeah. and, and people say, how can you write about 1930 South America? How can you do this? I, I expand myself. And, you know, right now mm -hmm. in the internet stage, it's great that you and I can do this, but mm -hmm. writers had a, they were hermits enough. You know, mm -hmm. now people think they don't have to leave the home, but how would I have met my lawyer? How would I have accidentally gotten my script position? Go out, go to the film festivals, but understand the personality of the festival and what they're looking for. Don't go to Sundance, go to Slamdance, go to South by Southwest, go to Telluride, Santa Barbara, mingle, uh, look presentable, and start offering stuff 
seemingly for free because you never know who's going to have some money there and, and bring you in. You mentioned that you mentioned that usually your pitch is about two minutes, and if you can do, if you mm -hmm. try to bring three or four things to pitch whenever you go to whenever you go to a pitch, can you? Um, go through and, the process. And we were also talking about the sort of the when you're pitching, when you're brought into pitch, or you're brought brought to a a meeting. There's going to be a few minutes where they find out whether or not you're the kind of person that should ever be in a room with anyone yeah. ever for any reason. And in, fact, <laughs> and in fact, you've actually, in fact, you've actually said that before. You you've said, look, you know, the reason this the reason where you and I are in this meeting is because they want to find out if we should ever be allowed into another meeting again. Yeah. With them, with with people. So oh. being pleasant at the beginning of the meeting and then actually being able to pitch multiple things, like those are qualifications that are required in order for you to work as a screenwriter if, uh, because otherwise you can't be in the room and they don't want to work with you. Yeah. Um, I even had people call me back saying, well, we don't really know if you're right, but everybody gets a gas out of um, you know, your pitches. I remember letters from Miramax saying, send Scott over any time, he's a blast. And part of this is personality, but part of it is actually you're putting on a performance in a pitch to an extent. You've done it in your writing. You know how to do it. You're inventing words that imaginary people say and putting it on paper. Be engaging. Understand that they're exhausted, especially if you're seeing them after three o'clock. They're already dead. And, and, and be uplifting. I do have my little formula for a pitch that works really well. And it's not it's exclusively my own, but it's my favorite. When you sit down, uh, you say your hellos. I, if something exceptional is happening in my career, I try to state it like working for the Nobels. All of a sudden, they're paying attention, especially at a pitch festival when you got five minutes, but also in an office because they say, oh, somebody else bet money on you. I can tell that to my boss so that even if we start to stumble with you, I say, hey, but Universal just spent twice as much on this same guy. And it kind of gets them out of the doghouse. So give them a couple of outs. So I start with um, the title of the script and the genre. Now you're gonna notice I go from broad perspective to telescoping into the things that matter, which is return on investment. Now, title, then genre, when it happens, and where it happens. So Baltimore stinks, it's an action comedy, it happens in current day, so you've already told them where it happens, they get a visual image right there. Go right into following your hero. They know that people tune in to see this hero go through an arc, so say, um, Ellen is working in a donut factory when she comes across a robot from outer space. You just, and her journey begins, you know, so you start almost the first word, you start with the name of the character. Why is this so important? They're told before they go to the pitch fest, follow this formula. Now you've all satisfied these things very quickly. You follow the person and for instance, in Die Hard, you follow Bruce Willis's character, but his nemesis was so original, you put in a little bit about his main antagonist, nemesis, what makes him so special, but you move through it really quickly. And they say, through the course of this, he's going to be defeating them in a building. It's a hardware movie, and it all happens on this floor, centering around him. But don't tell much of the rest of your story because they're gonna get lost. Uh, you're telling too much at one time about a timeline story. Jump right to a set piece. Set piece is something that happens in real time, but why is that so important? I'd say 80%, and, and, and Barry Lennon confirmed this, 80% of your trailer material comes out of a set piece, whether it's a comedy or an action film. So, you, so just spend 30 seconds just on one set piece, take them there, create the room, the arena, the so characters. When, you, when you're talking about a set piece, you mean like uh, in Die Hard, it's like the set piece is the building that they have to move up and down, and in Terminator, the, the end, the first Terminator, the end set piece is the factory that ends up crushing right. the, the Terminator. So there's this, so you, you feature one of the, one, the biggest um, scene that uh, at the end, do you, like, do you want to go ahead and um, like pitch me Die Hard? That, well, I think it's more useful. Normally mm -hmm. I, I would, but I'd have to think about that because um, mm -hmm. I really want it to be fine tuned and worthy of your time. Right. Understanding what a set piece is is most essential. Mm -hmm. A set piece usually happens in real time or close to it, mm -hmm. and it has uh, the height of conflict, uh, enough so that it can stretch for close to three to five minutes. And you're going to be uh, detailing, uh, for instance, in um, 
uh, in Superbad. I'll use that again because a lot of your writers are young and they've probably seen it. Um, so the nerdiest guy in the world goes into this liquor store. He's got a fake ID that is so fake and he actually just says just one name, McLovin. And he brings it up to the woman to buy a whole bunch of liquor and she's so tired and worried about her exam, she just wants to take him. And right in the middle of the transaction, he's sucker punched by some guy that is the dangerous, most dangerous thug you've ever heard, you know, ever seen in the world. His friends outside see this and think they're going to get busted. They try to flee. They're run over by a limousine, and the guy's a crook, so drags him into the limousine. The police show up, and because they're so tired of being hated in the community, they actually say, let's make this guy the hero of this party. We're going to bring him around in the cruiser. We're going to make his night. And we're going to show him how cool this policeman we are, which leads them to smoking pot, crashing cars, shooting off guns, running over other dealers. And then they rescue the two guys that wouldn't let him come along. So it all comes full circle. So the McLovin guy is the linchpin to saving our heroes at the end. It's awesome. It's the most outrageous things you've ever seen. There you go. You just set a set piece. Right. All right. So, so, and, no. <laughs> so your objective, so your objective whenever you're doing your pitch is actually to uh, set the title, genre, time, place, and then, uh, and name the character and, and then sort of get to the point where you've got like a good set piece that they want to see and then yeah. stop. Not, in other words, what you don't want to do is get to the point where you've told them the whole story and you don't want to get them to the point where you said, uh, uh, where, where they feel like they've had the sense of completion. They know where the story ends up and how it got there. Making them want more, but this is the finale that's so important. Mm -hmm. Almost all good movies have an element of irony in it. In Superbad, the guy that thought he was doing something all wrong in relationships, turns out he was doing everything all right. Or in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, it's the father that was the biggest loser, turns out to be able to save his family against the most enormous beasts in the world. This element of irony is the underdog story that helps them walk away with saying, I like the pitch. I wonder how else people were rooting for the dad or for these lovers to get together. Um, and so I always finish with that element of irony, gets their imagination going. And you sometimes their imagination can be much stronger than if you fully detail your movie. So don't shoot yourself in the foot. If I finish, I usually say, and I know that they wanna hear more. I say, you wanna hear another pitch? and we go right into it, then they can justify it to the boss. Look, two pitches, really strong. You're gonna like this guy, and let's give him more time to prove he's a good writer by actually reading the, the pages. Is it a page turner, you know, which comes down to craft? So, <laughs> we've covered such a lot of things. So, um, yeah. and I think we talked about, um, we talked about doing another interview at some point in the future where you're going to talk more about working with China because it's something yeah. you and one of the things you and I had both talked about is the fact that I remember in 2006, 2007, I was, and even before, because I was a member of Netflix early, I was going around saying, I think Netflix and, you know, Netflix and Amazon are going to be coming to Hollywood, you know, and everybody kept saying, no, no, it wouldn't happen. And they, they couldn't compete with the studios and all these things. And I'm like, they sell, Netflix sells $14 tickets to millions of people. How are they going to keep that market if they don't create original content? And there's not an acknowledgement or an understanding that production really can go worldwide. And not just production, but story can go worldwide. That, that these people are not, that China and other, there's other countries too, but China particularly, I mean, we may be entering a time of global storytelling. Well, what Germany, Ireland, Japan, and everybody else found out is the world tunes in to see how Americans are or live, or even if it's the born identity, how mm -hmm. they act in another country. Right. Is an intrigue. It's a mystery. It's a mystique. Mm -hmm. um, we can still make international movies, though, and take our formula for what's engaging mm -hmm. and spread it around the world. Now, we can have our art um, house films, you know, that are beautiful to see. They're memorable. As a matter of fact, the first script that really got me a big agent, um, it was tied in, the, uh, in, a, in a screenwriting contest with 3,000 people. And they said, everybody cried reading your script. It was so emotional. But for God's sakes, give us something that can sell. Nobody mm -hmm. can sell this when you're rich and famous. You know, so money does still move. Now, in mm -hmm. your mention of Hulu and Amazon and Netflix, you really are talking about a global market that has mm -hmm. to strongly embrace China. Hulu and Netflix are trying to get into China. There's a little bit of a barrier for good reasons. More mm -hmm. equitable deals and projects that are already ones that China would like to embrace and make money from. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes, that's up to you as the writer to come up with that story. Um, 
working with me, I'd be able to, to specifically tell you what part of your story is marketable in both countries. I would be overcomplicating things and doing a disservice to writers and producers to try to give you a shortcut formula that would answer yeah. that, you know? Okay. But it is a world market. The niche for, when streaming first start, started, it was started almost like reality TV. Mm -hmm. Production values could be lower, the process yeah. is faster or approved. Now production values are coming up to the point where many are on the same level as good television, but now they want to go beyond it. And I think the best reports I've heard for streaming is that that's where we're going to be able to make films, uh, uh, streaming shows on, on the level of film production values. Still, again, a lot of it has to be American centric or in story has to follow um, uh, the hero with a thousand faces. Right. Um, in writing for China, their niche market, um, they first had to go for blockbusters. Their niche market is really filmed six to $20 million. Mm -hmm. uh, broad young comedy. They have something called Lost in Thailand that's like um, our hangover. Six mm -hmm. million bucks made 200 million. They've got another $8 million film that made 300 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Pancake Man made 160 million, was shot for 3 million. But um, I can get more specific with uh, writers and production values. Sometimes, as you know, as a writer or somebody helps writers, they'll say, I've got three scripts. I say, tell me all three and I'll tell you which one's most marketable. Right. And that's exactly what the execs are mm -hmm. thinking and agents are thinking when you come in and pitch too. Well, and, and actually, you, you mentioned something really important there. I think, um, and actually, I, I want to harken back to it because I think sure. a lot of the people that I support, I have film people and television people. And what's interesting is that the streaming thing is like the intersection, like, a, I don't know if you've seen Russian Doll on um, Netflix. It's a, truly, it's like an amazing, 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 amazing uh, I want to say film, but it's not. It's a it's a ten segment series, but that's really a film that has ten. It's this. There's this thing. This, and I think it may become the new standard. This because it's a kind. It's a way to create loyalty. Netflix yeah. can create loyalty with these streaming ten segment stories. You have to go back to Netflix to get it because ain't nobody gonna go pirate ten. What if you don't get one of the episodes? Nothing will make sense, you know. Yeah. So. Um, there's changes in format um, that come along with streaming that are going to have a major impact on how we write because yes. it, it is not, it's not a television series where it goes on forever. It's where nobody ever learns anything. It's not something, it's more like Mad Men, except that Mad Men went seven seasons. So then there's this 10, there's this 10 section thing that's 10 yeah. hours. I mean, so there, there's an evolution happening and also, the other thing you mentioned about is um, we are truly, as a world, becoming more multicultural. So yeah. it is the case that the next Iron Man may not, quote, quote, Iron Man, um, or the next Johnny Depp, you know, for Pirates of the Caribbean, the next guy like that may not be a white male. You know, in, in other words, stories were being told worldwide, and the protagonists are changing to match the people that are watching the films in all of these diverse marketplaces, which is a good thing, but yeah. it's it's a... It is a difference. In the beginning of my filmmaking career, I kept casting Asians maybe 20 years ago. I think I've cast 35 of them in major small roles because most of my films and projects were small or I was using newcomers for sitcom. And they kept saying, why do you have two Asians in here? I said, because of the future. I saw the future coming. You know, we had that market there. They're interesting to watch. They have a different dynamic. They can bring a new flavor and motivation for their characters. Don't paste somebody in there like a Barbie doll because you think you're being culturally right understand what motivates them as somebody from that country. And that takes some study. You, you sometimes just can't wing that. I did great study um, for Blood, Sweat and Gold in South America and uh, did my research through Soldier of Fortune magazine, you know, when people that were writers there. Uh, what you really touched on in this 10 episodes is in loyalty brings us back to Disney. All the studios in the world now want to be Disney. How did that happen? They had a cultural identity established with people where you could tune in. Now, all of a sudden, Netflix is the place where if I say, I want to binge watch something worthy, it started for me with Stranger Things, and then it moves into Black Mirror. And, and I say, if I want to be totally engaged now, I don't look for the latest version of Friends on a, you know, a network. I say, what's trending long-term, on Netflix and that 
motivates you. It's like Game of Thrones, you know, probably strongest show ever made. It's one of the few that when I look at it, I'm in, I'm just amazed. I say, that's a show I couldn't write, which when you're an egotistical writer like me, it says a lot, you know, I think I can write anything, but I couldn't. And that brings us back to tentacles. Uh, a studio would break it into three films, a trilogy that takes six years to tell. Forget it. Nobody's going to hang around that long anymore. It's not going to be born identity. But what I have is the energy of Taken, Intriga 24, cinematography of the born identity with global appeal, in part because it's really talking about the underbelly of crookedness that we all don't want to admit, which is the dark state in the United States. But hey, Europe loves to look at the United States and says, aha, you're not well, perfect. China says the same. And you know what's interesting is, again, because I worked, um, I did, I worked for seven years in the UK, um, sort of telecommuting and then working there from time yeah. to time. And you know what? There's a dark underbelly. <laughs> there is a dark shadow under all of these, mm -hmm. under all of these governments. People, and the United States has its, the UK has its, I mean, and it's, it's crazy. I mean, it is crazy. And the, and the thing is that we, and nobody wants to look at it in your own country, probably because it's not safe to look at it. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> Very but, true. Because I, you know, the exposés come from other places to tell us the stuff that that we're crazy about, and then, and then yeah. we get like this this guy Epstein, you know, and then this other guy that in the UK they had who was he? It was like a a well beloved uh, comic guy. It turned out he was the most crazy, 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 crazy dangerous pedophile, just crazy yeah. dangerous. And he was at the top top of government. He was fatayed every single, you know, he was like the talk of the town for like 30 years. And yeah. everybody knew him, everybody knew him all the time. It was every level of government because he was involved in charities. And it's like, you know, yeah. so you're right. It's like, there's, there's the, there's this, when you're talking about um, writing, writers from around the world uh, yeah. are writing, are exposing these things in other countries that they don't live in. So that's why we keep yeah. seeing it on television. But, and it does make riveting TV because it's like, you just can't yeah. take your eyes off it. Well, it's the idea that I knew it was there, but I'm surprised right. how you got me there. Right. They tune in for the surprise, but it's a reaffirmation of something. So the suspension of disbelief is lower. We're right. seeing, oh, long ago, zombie movies had to be some strange gore thing, but now it's zombies are statements on society. Right. And that widened the genre. Now we're going to get into these other factors, right. you know. Well, like, and I think the I, zombies are kind of a perfect example, you know, the, because that was a commentary originally was a zombies were a metaphysical thing. There were people that didn't die, which is, you know, you could talk, it could be related to a million different things, uh, mental illness and uh, um, getting rid of dead bodies is always a hassle. But then it turned, now recently it's turned into a thing about um, epidemic, right? Well, How many zombies are epidemic? Right. So you say, when, are the, when is the Zika virus going to come here and turn us into zombies? Or are they going to release something? Um, now they're actually, if you look at some of the trends in zombies, they're getting mm -hmm. more humane and artistic. Like uh, there was one about the zombie that is halfway zombie and he falls in love with a girl. And because he falls in love, he becomes mm -hmm. a normal boy again. Right. Um, I actually have a zombie movie. I said, the mm -hmm. only way I'm going to write this, it's mm -hmm. called uh, Nudes of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. And... We start out with all the, every scene with the zombie starts off mimicking one of the great mm -hmm. uh, artworks of the Renaissance, like David or The Last Supper, but they're all zombies. And then it goes into something. And it's really kind of funny because I, I found a way to bring art and creativity that was missing from the zombies out in. Right, to make, it, to make it sort of a more, to elevate the, the dialogue about yeah. the zombies because they are kind of boring. The other thing I was going to, and I, we should, God, we're writers, we could talk forever. Uh, but, um, yeah, we're just talking ourselves to death here. No, but that's not true. It's actually not a bad thing. You know, people <laughs> are going to watch it are the people that care about story. But um, the other one is uh, Westworld. Because one uh -huh. of the things that was interesting uh, meta, when you're watching the new Westworld is they made the robots naked. And the conversation about Westworld ultimately is who's human? You know? Yeah. So by making these people consistently naked all of the time, it was riveting. It was riveting to watch. Yeah. But more importantly, it, it did, as time has evolved, it became, they were so brutal to these people and they were depersonalized so much yeah. and they were used as machines so much. And overall, more and more, it's become a matter of, yeah, that's like real life. That actually, that actually happens. Yeah. 
we are, and the internet, you know, with dataism, um, one of my big uh, other books on creativity, it's really a philosophy for staying human in the digital age, because it's becoming so easy. That's a whole nother topic we'll get into in our next interview, which I really look forward to. But I hope I've given screenwriters a new taste on something that they can't read in a book, they don't get in class, but it's encouraging, but just realize the arena you're entering. You have an opportunity to really shine, not just on paper, but to be engaging, be something that you create um, out of the nowhere that you put on paper with these people. You know, be presentable, be the person to be called back. Um, come to me if uh, you have a project that's partially formulated and we'll work together on it. You will well, or, or, and I think you also mentioned that you were there, you were available to help people who needed just help understanding pitching or, yeah. in, or needed or had gotten themselves involved in a deal that was starting to go crazy. Yeah. And you didn't well, know quite what to do next. Like in other words, when somebody says, you know, well, you're the writer, but we're going to have this other writer step in, you know, and we're not really going to pay you any different. And it's like, like what just happened there? Like, why did this even happen to me? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I tell my um, clients, whether they're a studio in China or a writer on the street, I say, all right, you're going to start getting into talks. I'm not going to go there with you because this is your right to hold your own meeting. But write down notes and afterwards, or if they call you on the phone, call me up and say, hey, they just told me this. What does it really mean? And I'll tell you what it really means. Is it a trap? Is it a trick? Is it endorsing? Is it your future? Um, are they just uh, themselves uh, needing answers? Um, it's almost impossible for a newcomer uh, in other, no, regardless of your background. You could be the biggest whiz on Wall Street. You don't know. You just don't know. Well, I think it also kind of brings full circle to what you, what you said previously, and I think something that is being lost. It used to be the case that when film did cost $1,000 a minute, it wasn't the case that they were just going to hand some, they weren't even going to let somebody write until they'd been on set often enough to know what actors needed, you know, and, and had watched, just they needed to see the whole process. That's gone now. So there's, there's no window into that world. So without, you, you were mentored initially and you had people who would sit down with you for their own economic reasons at the time, because yeah. who doesn't need a good pet writer? But you know, they chose to work with you, they chose to support you. And I think that there's not a lot, I haven't met, screenwriters mostly don't want to leave the, leave the house. It's hard to find screenwriters that want to mentor other screenwriters. Part of it, I think, is because it's just, they're busy trying to make their own living and or because they don't understand what happens or, and don't feel su successful enough. Or maybe they're just like Esther House, they're n not the kind of people that- uh, Esther House. Um, <laughs> um, you would have to know Esther House and live through his era to know what that means. But I'll tell you something <laughs> that would sound like an insult, um, but it wasn't. Uh, somebody uh, who had been tracking my career for a while, uh, they texted me out of the blue. They said, Oh, Scott, the big screenwriter, the guy that goes over to, he was, uh, they were mocking me. Like, how come you don't drive a Ferrari? How come you don't do this? They were kind of getting toward that. And they, they said, um, I said, actually, you know, I'm really proud of what I do. I listen to people and I move them closer to the dream of creating something that means something to them. Could be cathartic, could be their own life story or their father's. But if I can just move people toward that magnificent feeling, uh, this thing that only humans can do regardless of AI, which is to create something out of nothing that moves other people. Um, this is one of the great challenges of moving into dataism. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, sometimes, I'm literally, people have come up and said I have this and I go, oh my gosh, this is gonna be so many hours. I like the person though. I want them, I, I, I sense something coming up, if not now in two years or five years when, they write a totally different screenplay and everything I told them comes together. You know, it's like the teacher in school, but I'm proud of that at the same time that I need to make a good living and do my stuff in China. Well, here's, you know, here's also my kind of feeling is if, if writers are the kind of people that get benefit from things that other people don't get benefit from, from, I swear to God, for me, it's the story. Like I, you go to, you go through experiences in life and all of a sudden it, you're in a room and it turns into something. And all of a sudden you're watching the best, the best story you've ever seen play out in real time. And that's something that doesn't, like that's not something that a lot of other people get rewarded by. And yeah. I, so when somebody says, 
you know, it's not the case, even when writers have a lot of money, it's very rarely the case that you see them driving around in Ferraris. If they were that kind of person, they'd be producers, right? It's uh, like, I know a lot of producers yeah. who could conceivably write, you know, they, they, ha they tell, they, they know the story, they know what to do, da, 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 they know how to manipulate people, but it's not their interest. They don't, yeah. so it, writers are a different kind of person. They find, they get different rewards, you know? Well, here, here's something to think about. Throughout mm -hmm. society, the most powerful force in the world has always been story. It has never been an army. It's never been a form of money. People came to Egypt to see these great sculptures of the Pharaoh out of gold that they couldn't imagine. And they dedicated the next four generations of their life for something that in a story talked about the evolution of a human being to a more spiritual level. Regardless of what country you're in, the power of story, was what brought people toward a unified goal and allowed them to sacrifice for something that everybody knew was inside of them they couldn't articulate, but the storyteller did. It gave their life meaning, and that's really what the story does. I, I agree 100%. I definitely think stories, stories change the world. And if you think of, there have been huge stories that have changed the world. And, it, and, um, and when you look at something like To Kill a Mockingbird or a story like 1984 or a story like it's it, maybe the thing about um, being a screenwriter or being a novelist or being those people, we have, maybe we're really more ambitious. Maybe it's not just a question. Maybe your Ferrari is too little. Anybody could have a Ferrari. Yeah. I'm going to give you a character you'll never forget. I'm giving you Atticus Finch. Atticus yeah. Finch. Look at uh, Anne Frank. Um, right. You know, and uh, other, other stories, true or, or fictitious. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, yeah. it's, Sometimes the best stories, though, make terrible movies. Ayn Rand is still struggling. <laughs> well, I think, the, I think the hard part is because it, 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 I mean, we can always look at the broken stories, but there's a reason why they're broken, you know? And, but I think, um, so what I'm going to do, uh, since we've had the time to chat, I'm going to go ahead and edit this up. I'll send you a, a um, copy to review to make sure that it's okay. And then I'll distribute it to my group. And then we'll start talking about a time where you can uh, come and address the work that you're doing in China. And Which then, is fascinating, yeah. I, well, you know, I just think you're right. I mean, I, it's like I can see coming down the track. It's going to be, a, and here's the other thing. The use, so there's this whole notion. Sometimes there's this like, we don't want the, the, the world invading the United States. Well, you know, da, da, da. Well, you know what? That's kind of true. I want the United States, what I love best about the United States, to go around the world. And what that is, is a story about the United States story is, we can all do better together. We can all do more together. We can all make more things happen together. Yeah. You know, we are, there's something fundamentally, and I guess, and if you think you were talking a moment again about, about um, China and its relationship to family, you, if we take all of these best notions from around the world and we have an actual dialogue in media, we can change, you know, we don't know what the world's going to look like in a while, but we know the conversation is beginning now. Well, we share in all of us certain things such as we know epigenetically that we're, we're drawn to comfort a crying baby. Mm -hmm. Breaking it down to something that simple, mm -hmm. that we want to make our life better for our children. But now, globally, due to technology and everything else, um, new ingredients are thrown in the mix. And it will not necessarily come down to politicians leading us in the right yes. direction. It will come down to the creators of stories that find something to be the mortar. Yes. The bricks that build something. And that's true. Uh, yeah. And, and part of the reason I'm writing my other greater books is uh, one day I won't be here, but my books might. Right. And, um, so I think, I think we really see a lot of common ground. I would like to, mm -hmm. I would like to share what I know mm -hmm. uh, about China so that um, we can unlock the greatest potential from the young minds that will follow. Mm -hmm. And, by completely sidestepping all politics, we can tell these stories together. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's my key interest in China, so. Right. Well, and I think you made a good point you were talking before about Disney. Disney's kind of a perfect example. I once watched a, I was watching a, a kid in Iraq and his mom was, their bombs were falling, American bombs were falling, I believe. She had the kid by the hand. Do you know what he was wearing? Huh. Lion King pajamas. Ah, there you go. Um, a lot of power there. We could talk forever, but thanks for uh, working with me on this. Thank you very much. Down. And we're going to have tons of fun on the next one. Yes. Uh, oh, um, let me see.
Does anybody know how to get hold of me or do you take care of that? No, no. <laughs> Actually, I got so distracted. <laughs> so how can people reach you? Okay. By phone, my phone number, you can text or call 424-332-8993. Mm -hmm. Best email for me to use is pretty much global. It's a mm -hmm. Gmail account, even though I have private ones for my company. It is sitcom.director at Gmail. So that's sitcom, cool. S-I-D-C-O-M dot director at gmail.com. I'm really easy. I'm just like this when you call me up. Um, cool. I'm curious about you. Cool. And then the, um, all right, great. So I'll go ahead and I'll put that information at the, um, along the bottom of the thing, and then I'll send it over to you to review and then we'll, um, and I'll start promoting it, um, going forward. But I want to take uh, time to thank you very much for thank speaking you. with me about today's, uh, topics and, I, also for, um, giving a lot of insight into the, the behind the scenes aspects of working in Hollywood. Well, from one goofball writer to another, <laughs> I'll see you next time. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you very much. You're wonderful.